morning. Before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, plug for CCA, Church, a Certified Church Administration Administrator, because um, Tom, Roger, and I were all three in the same program at Candler, and I'm just very proud to be a part of that group. So great friendships are made, networking, wonderful learning. So again, if you're thinking about it, I encourage you to continue down that path, keep exploring. We're glad to speak with you at any time about it. If you have had a chance to check out the bio for our next speaker, Dr. Ryan Burge, then you already know that he is an assistant professor in political science at Eastern Illinois University. You already know that he is a prolific published author on such topics as the nuns, we're not, you know, the joke is always, you know, we're talking about N-O-N-E-S and not N-U-N-S, and the future of American religion. But what you do not know from his bio is that he pastors a church with an average attendance of 10 to 15 people. So, in the past, he has been a plumber, an electrician, a drywall installer, a negotiator of insurance premiums, and a real estate agent of church property. Now, in other words, if he ever decides to leave the academic world, he has a future as a church administrator. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Ryan Burge to TCN. Thanks, Kelly. Hey, everybody. Do you guys like graphs? You're going to get a lot of graphs today. This talk goes a lot different with the theologians than it does with you folks, because you guys like the numbers. And you're going to see a lot of numbers today about what's going on with American religion. Um, I'm going to say up front, there's a lot here that's going to worry you. But I hope to leave you with just a sliver of possibility and hope that things don't have to be the way they are. Um, James Baldwin said, not everything that's faced can be changed, but not anything can be changed until it's faced. And I think that's sort of my job is to say, here's where we are, but where we end up is up to all of us. So let's get right to it, shall we? As all good research agendas begin, it started with a tweet. That's a joke, because most academics don't even know what Twitter is. Um, <laughs> This is the tweet. I'm going to show you this graph uh, bigger in just a second. But when I sent this graph out in 2019, I was a very not well-known academic. Um, I had a couple hundred Twitter followers. I was a, a visiting professor. No one was calling me about American religion back in 2019. I sent this graph out, and all of a sudden it goes viral. I looked down at my phone 10 or 15 minutes later, and I had 20 or 30 retweets. I wake up the next morning, I had a couple hundred retweets. And over the next couple weeks, my life changed dramatically and drastically, and I am where I am today because of that silly tweet a couple years ago. It was on the front page of CNN. It was on the New York Post, the Washington Post, the New York Times, both recreated that graph. Um, I was being called by everyone and no one all at the same time. It made the front page of Reddit, which is right there, got 71,000 upvotes, which... If you want to go viral, that's a great place to do it. I had people I hadn't spoken to in 20 years emailing me and say, I saw you on this or that or the other thing. I was on C-SPAN on Easter Sunday morning of 2019. I had never spoken to a reporter in my life, and I spoke to a dozen in the week after that tweet. It changed everything for me. And so when I was approached about writing a book... They said, what topic do you want to write about? And I said, I want to write about the nuns because what I've learned is, as Wayne Gretzky once said, you don't skate to where the puck is, you skate to where the puck is going. And everyone was interested in learning about the nuns. Everyone. And so that's where the book comes from. This is that graph. Just a little larger and with some different colors. I'm going to break a couple of these down in just a second. But obviously the big thing we want to look at is that purplish line going from flat, flat, flat to up. And then that 
orangish line, the main line, I'm going to talk about them in a second, going down. Let's talk about a couple groups specifically here. Here's the nuns, okay? In 1972, about 1 in 20 Americans said they had no religious affiliation. I was digging through some archives the other day from conference proceedings in the 1960s, because this is what academics do, and one sociologist called the nuns the neglected category in 1968. They were so small, you couldn't even do anything with them statistically. 5% of America is not a whole ton of people, and your whole sample is only 2,000 folks. So, look at this. From 1972 to 1990, the share of nuns rose just 2% between 1972 and 1990. And from that point forward, boom called hockey stick growth. Almost every single year or every other year the GSS comes out and the share of Americans who are nuns rises. It was over 12% by 1998. It was closing in on 16% by 2008. And then in 2018, it rose to nearly 24%. But I've got even worse news. This is six different polling firms. The share of Americans they say are nuns. Gallup, says it's around 21%. The Cooperative Election Study puts it at 37%. Pew puts it around 30%. That's probably the best number that we have. 30% of all adult Americans have no religious affiliation. It's the largest religious category in America today. And it's growing. And I'm gonna show you that in just a second. But how about evangelicals? Here's a story that you don't know much about because no one tells you this story. There are more evangelicals in America today than there were in 1972. There are over 70 million evangelicals in America right now. And there were 70 million evangelicals in America in 1993. Now, the percentage has dropped from 30% in 1993 to 21.5% today. But here's an interesting little statistic for you. In 1988, 38% of Americans said they'd had a born-again experience in their life. In 2018, it was 41% of Americans have said they've had a born-again experience in their life. The share of Americans who identify, self-identify as evangelical today is as large as it was 13 years ago. Evangelicals are doing just fine demographically. But other groups are not doing so well. This is the Catholic Church. 27% of Americans were Catholic in 1972. Today, about 23% of Americans are Catholic. I show this when I give this talk to the Catholic bishops, and they go, hmm, very good. I'm going to tell you a part where they're not so happy about. In 1972, 55% of Catholics went to Mass every week, and now 25% of Catholics go to Mass every week. So the number here looks good, but what's going on under the surface looks really, really tragic. Um, cultural Catholicism rules the day now. So, this is uh, my people. I'm an American Baptist. We're part of the mainline tradition. That might not be a term you're fully aware of, but American Baptists, United Methodists, Episcopalians, uh, Disciples of Christ, United Church of Christ, those are PCUSA. Those are mainline traditions in America. In 1975, 31% of America were mainline Protestant. No tradition has gotten to 31% in the last 50 years, except for mainline Protestants. They were the largest religious tradition in America. And actually, I've looked at statistics that I can't verify, but say that over 50% of Americans were mainline Protestants back in the 1950s. And now, they're 10% of America. And I think there's a very good chance in the next 10 years they become 5% of America because the average mainline Protestant in America today is about 60 years old. Only 15% of Episcopalians have kids at home. The Episcopal Church, the Episcopal Church has done more burials than baptisms the last four years in a row. Things are not looking good for the mainline. So, why? Right? This is where you want, you want that little, like, that little uh, article, that clickbait article you see online. Two simple reasons why America is leaving religion. You're not going to get that here. I have a PhD. We don't do anything simple. Okay? It's complicated. 
If anyone tells you it's simple, they're lying to you or they're trying to sell you something. Okay? It is most definitely not simple. It's incredibly, incredibly complicated. I'm going to knock through a couple of reasons here. There's a lot more in the book. We'll hit the high notes. First, I feel like I'm teaching class right now. Secularization theory. Secularization theory is this, this kind of foundational theory of the sociology of religion. It was put together by a guy named Max Weber, not Weber, Weber. You learned that in grad school. V's or W's? W's or V's? Max Weber said, as the society becomes more educated and economically prosperous, it becomes less religious. What Weber says is, imagine that you're on the tundra back in the day and you're trying to grow crops. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, it stops raining for three months or three years and all your crops don't grow and your family dies or imagine your wife's giving birth to a child and both she and the child die and you think to yourself why in the world are all these terrible things happening to me back in the day they said it's god right it's god punishing us for the crops not growing it's god punishing me for my child dying what weber says is you know what happens the more education you get you realize it's meteorology or virology not God, right? So Weber has this um, German term. I am not going to say that word. You can say it to yourself right now. I don't even know how to say it. It's been translated as disenchantment, but I love this translation. Demagication. What Weber says is what science has basically done is demagified our lives. Right? So now why does it not rain? Because we understand climatology right? and weather patterns. Not because God's happy or not happy with us. It's just a natural process. So the more educated we get, the less we need God. And then, don't run out of the room, don't run out of the room. Our friend Karl Marx, right? Karl Marx talked a lot about what he called eternal class consciousness. And he said... That religion is essentially a tool used by your overseers to keep you happy. Right? Work as to the Lord and not as to men. You know, you used to say that a lot, slave owners. Right? Keep working because you're doing it for God, not for me. And so he called religion the opium of the people, right? It's the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. Weber thought that religion was a weapon used by rich people to keep people poor and happy in their poverty. Well, is there any data that backs this up? Let's look at Western Europe. 58% of Poles go to church every week, which is crazy high. Poland is a crazy outlier, by the way, especially because it used to be an Eastern Bloc country. But beyond that, look at the countries that we think of Western Europe. Spain, 14% of people go every week. Uh, Austria, 11%. Belgium, 8%. Germany, 8%. France, 6%. Sweden, 6%. Finland, 5%. The Czech Republic and Estonia, less than 1 in 20 people go to church every week in Estonia. Weber would look at this and go, aha, look, right? Look at this, and look at this. This is a scatter plot. On the x-axis, the bottom axis, it's GDP per capita, which is a measure of economic prosperity. On the y is the percentage of people who say that religion is very important. You notice the relationship here? It's negative, right? It goes down. The more economically prosperous a country is, the less likely they are to say they need God. Look at Switzerland, very close neighbor of us in terms of economics. The average GDP is over $60,000 a year, and about 12% of them say religion is very important. But do you notice a little outlier there in the top right? That's us. God bless America. 52% of Americans say religion is very important in their lives. If this fit the trend line, it would be about 10% of Americans say religion is very important in their lives. We are crazy religious. Actually, the bigger question is, why are we not more secular than we are right now? We buck the trend in every possible way. And Baber would go, just wait. You'll get there. right? You'll fit the trend line eventually. By the way, just a quick aside, look at the countries behind, on the bottom side of the trend line. Russia, Albania, Bulgaria, Belarus, China, Estonia. Do you see those? You know what they all have in common? Communism, right? Marx would go, yeah, look at that. So, secularization. Here's another one that most people don't think about because they don't do surveys all the time. There's this fancy word we use in the social sciences called social desirability bias. 
And it is the idea that you are lied to when you give someone a survey. I love how academics give fancy names to really basic concepts. Social desirability bias is the idea that you are, when someone asks you a question on a survey, you're going to lie about it. You're like, not me, right? I would never lie about something on a survey. You're walking through the mall. You guys remember malls? <laughs> You're walking through the mall. Guy pulls you aside and goes, I'll give you $10 if you take a five-minute survey. And you say, I like money. Okay. Pulls you in a, in a side room and starts asking you questions, basic questions at first, age, gender, race, um, you know, region of the country, but then he starts asking you questions like, oh, I don't know, do you masturbate? Are black people lazy? Have you ever cheated on your spouse? Do you do drugs? How many drugs? What kind of drugs? Do you like drugs? Or should a woman be president? You know what's going to happen when you're asked those questions? You're going to lie. And you know what people lie about a lot? Religion. And we know this for a fact. And here's how we know. This is one of my favorite stories in American social science. So, a couple of social scientists back in the early 1990s went to Ashtabula County, Ohio, which is a rural county in Ohio. And they said, okay, we're going to figure out how many people actually go to church every Sunday. So they did a survey of people in Ashtabula County. They asked the question, do you go to church every week? On that survey, 36% of people said they attended church every week, which is a little high, but not crazy high, from what we see in other surveys. So 36% of people went to church every week, and they said, you know what we should do? Let's check. <laughs> so they did. This is the 1990s. They had a couple of research. God bless graduate assistants, because they get the worst jobs in the world. Their job was to call every church in the phone book in Ashtabula County, Ohio, and ask the pastor how many people were in church last Sunday. And when they didn't answer the phone, they would drive through the parking lot and count the cars in the church parking lot and do a little formula to figure out how many cars equals how many people. And they came to a number. You want to guess what percentage of Ashtabula County actually goes to church every Sunday? About 20%. You know what that tells us? Half the people who say they go to church lie about it. That creates a really difficult problem for us, though, right? A really difficult problem. Because when I say the nuns are 30%, is it really 30% or is it higher than that? People are lying to us. Imagine this. You're an atheist in Mississippi born in 1960. Are you going to tell anyone that you're an atheist in Mississippi in 1972, 1978? 1988. You don't want to lose your family, your friends, your job, and your entire life. So what do you do? You shut up, right? When you're asked on a survey, what are you? You say, I'm a Southern Baptist, right? Well, guess what's happened over the last couple years? The internet's made it okay to be an atheist in Mississippi. You go Google atheist in Mississippi, you find a subreddit and a Facebook group and a discussion forum. And you know what happens when they ask you on a survey? Are you an atheist now? You say, sure am. So actually what might be happening here is not the numbers have risen, it's they've always been there. It's now people are just being honest with us on surveys. Now the problem with that is, can I go, I can't go back to someone and go, you took the GSS in 1992 and it says here that you're, you were Catholic. Were you lying then? And are you lying to me now? You see the problem here? We can never statistically figure out just how much this is happening, but we do know it is in fact happening and happening a lot. So every number you see might actually not be the number. It might actually be social desirability bias. And then we've got to talk about politics. We have to. I know everyone's like, oh, here we go. So I'll give you the two minute spiel here. The average American thinks the religious right rose over what we call culture war reasons, okay? Abortion, same-sex marriage, pornography, obscenity, things like that. That's sort of the traditional understanding of what made the religious right what it is today. But there are other theories out there. I'll just hit on one or two real quick. That piece, The Real Origin of the Religious Right, is written by Randall Balmer, who's an Episcopal priest and also a professor at Dartmouth. He argues the genesis of the religious right was actually not about abortion and gay marriage. It was about race. He tells the story of a Holmes County, Mississippi. Uh, they desegregated the schools in Holmes County. After Brown versus Board, they fought it for over 10 years to desegregate the schools. And when, as soon as the schools 
got desegregated, there was a Christian school that opened up in Holmes County, Mississippi, and within two years, not a single white child was going to the public school in Holmes County, Mississippi. They were all going to the private Christian school in Holmes County, Mississippi. And then the IRS stepped in and sued that private Christian school, saying you do not deserve a tax exempt status because we know what you're doing. You're trying to dodge or, uh, desegregation. And so what Balmer says is really about race. It's not about abortion or same-sex marriage. Now, I will say a lot of people have sort of criticized Balmer, but there is a grain of truth in what he's talking about. Another theory is from Kevin Cruz, wrote a book called um, One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Created Christian America, and he makes some really interesting connections between Billy Graham and William Randolph Hearst. You know, Graham was actually sort of, Graham, well, he managed to court corporate interests in America, and William Randolph Hearst told his reporters they should puff Graham in his newspapers in the 1930s and 40s. Um, the corporate elites got together in the 1950s and had a sermon writing contest. The topic of the sermon, if you wrote the best sermon, they would give you $1,000. You know what the topic was? Why capitalism is a God-ordained system. See what's happening here, right? They're trying to inculcate the idea that capitalism is the best way to do things in the world, right? And then there's this idea of Christian nationalism, too, which is rising right now. I tell you all that to tell you that if you think that it's just very clear, you know, culture war leads to the religious right, it's way more complicated than that. It's race, it's gender, it's economics, it's all these issues tied together have created this sort of collision and intersection of politics and religion in the 21st century. But it all ends in this. You can't tell me that it does not at some level involve politics. Over 50% of people who identify as liberals say they have no religious affiliation now. It's 12% of people who identify as conservative. Okay? 50% of liberals now have no religious affiliation it's only 12% of conservatives, and it's about 22% of moderates. There's absolutely a thing that's happening in American politics and American religion where people assume to be religious is to be conservative politically, and to be none is to be liberal. There are not a whole lot of conservative nuns, and there are not a whole lot of liberal Protestants left in this country anymore. It used to be a completely different situation. So, other theories. The internet... Can't discount that, but good luck trying to measure that, right? When did you get Facebook? You know, like you can't answer that in questions. Um, there's this really interesting theory by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone, um, where he tracked bowling league membership from the 1930s to the 1980s and found the share of Americans bowling in bowling leagues dropped by 75% over 50 years. That's the title of his book, where uh, we don't bowl in bowling leagues anymore. We bowl alone. So maybe religion just being caught up in the fact that we don't. We have Netflix now. We don't have to leave the house. You know? I actually, I always joke that this book should be called Tweeting Alone or Facebooking Alone or TikToking Alone or Netflixing Alone now. Right? Because we don't do stuff together anymore. We're just not social creatures like we used to be. And there's other theories. Uh, the lack of trust. You know, we can go on and on about the Catholic Church scandal, but also what's happening in the Southern Baptist Convention right now, what's happening in other denominations. There's a lot of scandal. We're losing um, trust in all institutions, not just religion, okay, whether it be all forms of government, banks, unions. We have less trust in any of that stuff now than at any point in the last 50 years, and religion's being swept up in that whole idea. So I do think there's something to be said for lack of trust. And there's also the decline of the family. Right? The child-free movement, um, the skyrocketing divorce rate, all those things play into that. I don't have time to touch on a lot of that stuff here, but it all plays into this whole thing. Let's talk about demographics really quick. Age, gender, race, education. Um, this is the graph. If you don't take anything away from what I say today, this is the thing I want you to take away. This is what the future of America looks like. I broke down uh, the American population into five generations. Silent generation, 1925 to 1945. Silent generation, 71% of the silent generation are Protestant or Catholic. Okay? 71% of the silent generation are Protestant or Catholic, and about 18% of them are nuns. Got that? 71 versus 18. They're dying by the thousands right now, right? Look who's coming. Generation Z, born 1996 or later. Okay, so the youngest adults, 22% Protestant, 17% are Catholic, which means that 37% of the Generation Z are Christians, and 
5% of them are nuns. It's the first generation in the history of the country where the nuns outnumber the Christians clearly. And it's only going to go up from there. So every day in America, guess what's happening? The silent generation is dying, and guess who's replacing them? Generation Z. That's how we're getting less religious. It's not people leaving religion. That doesn't happen as much as you think it does. What's actually happening is old religious people are dying, and they're being replaced by much less religious people. That's what's called generational replacement. It's how things change over time. And you can see, look at that perfect cascade of how those lines go down. Notice, by the way, Protestants go from 49 to 22, and Catholics only go from 22 to 15. Right? The share of Protestants has dropped in half amongst Generation Z. And 32% of them identifies nothing in particular. We'll talk about that in a second. This is what America looks like today. 34% of them are Protestants. 23% of them are nothing in particular. And 18% of them are Catholic. I want to point out something for you. While you hear a lot of news stories about Mormons, Buddhists, Jews, and Muslims, guess what? There are not that many of them in America. 1% of America is Latter-day Saint. 1%. That's a rounding error. On a typical survey, you might get 15 Mormons out of 1,000 people. There are not that many of them, yet they, these kind of smaller religious groups play an outsized role in American discourse for some reason. There's a real housewives of Salt Lake City, Utah, guys. <laughs> Did you know that Tulsa, Oklahoma is twice the size of Salt Lake City? You see any real housewives of Tulsa, Oklahoma out there? You see what I'm saying? We're fascinated by small religious groups. We need to keep them in proper perspective, right? 1% of America. But here's what 22-year-olds look like. The most common option they pick on surveys is nothing in particular. One in three young people, college-age people, say they are nothing in particular. 32%. 21% are Protestants and 15% are Catholics. Notice something here, though, that's really interesting. Only 7% of them are atheists and 6% are agnostic. That's basically in line with the general population. So young people are not more likely to be atheists or agnostic than the general population is. They're more likely to be nothing in particular. Nothing in particular. So this is a new graph. I just made this last week, and I got really excited about it. This is the share of people raised without religion in the red. And then the darker bars are people who had no religion when they were between 18 and 25 years old. Okay? For people born between 1950 and 1954, only 4% of them were raised with no religion. Okay? Only 4% of people born in the 1950s were raised with no religion. And now 13% of that group had no religion when they moved into early adulthood. But then you go down, look over, look over, and look at the bottom on the right side. Those are people born in the 1990s. Now, 14% of them are being raised without religion. But look, a third of them now had no religion as they were moving into early adulthood. So what's happening is half of that 30% is people being raised without religion, but the other half is people leaving faith somewhere in their teens or early 20s. Okay, That's when people leave religion, in that 15 to 25-year-old time frame. Okay? People are being raised without religion. That's absolutely true, and that's rising, but the share is in doubling at 25th birthday. That's telling us that people are leaving faith behind when they are very, very young. I did a survey where we asked people what the most religious you were. What age were you the most religious? You know what the most common response was? Between 8 and 12 years old. Okay? It's happening early in life. That's where things are falling apart. It's not 25-year-olds or 30-year-olds. It's people early in life, 18, 15 to 25 years old. Okay, so race, white people, 23 to 36 percent between 2008 and 2021. Okay, but look at black, 20 percent none in 2008, now 36 percent. Almost a doubling in the last 13 years amongst African Americans. Okay? Hispanics are the least likely to be nuns now, 33%. And then Asians are the most likely to be nuns now at 42%. So nearly half of Asian Americans have no religious affiliation. Okay? It's hitting everyone, every single group, every single race, every single age. Nuns are not all created equal, guys. There's a huge difference between atheists agnostics, and nothing in particular. 
In 2021, 24% of Americans were nothing in particular, 7% were atheists, and 6% were agnostic. If you put five nuns in a room, you know what you get? One atheist, one agnostic, and three nothing in particular. Most nuns are nothing in particular. They're not atheists or agnostics. They're something else entirely. Okay? We're going to talk about them. Uh, that's age. Look at this. This is really where the rubber meets the road, though. 51% of atheists have a four-year college degree. 45% of agnostics have a four-year college degree. 25% of nothing in particular have a four-year college degree. You guys seeing the differences now? Nothing in particular is the largest category. It's also one of the least educated categories of any religious group in America today. Look at this, the share with a bachelor's degree. In America, it was 25% of Americans had a bachelor's degree in 2008. It's risen to 35% today. Amongst atheists, it's risen 18 percentage points during that same time period. So double the national average, okay? From 33 to 51%. Agnostics have risen 11 points to keep up with the national average. And look at nothing in particular. Still at 25% with a bachelor's degree. That's what America had 13 years ago. Nothing in particular is are falling behind America in every possible way. Look at this. Income. 60% of nothing in particular is make less than $50,000 a year, which means most people in this category are in poverty. Nothing in particular. Amongst atheists, it's only 40%. Amongst agnostics, it's 45%. Only 13% of nothing in particular is make six figures as a household. Okay? These people are not doing well educationally, and they're not doing well economically. And look at this. This is the share who only have a high school degree and make less than $50,000 a year. A third of nothing in particulars make less than $50,000 a year and have a high school degree. Atheist, it's 12%. Agnostics, it's 16%. You guys see the picture that's emerging here? The nuns are not who you think they are. Most of them are nothing in particular. And they're not Nietzsche quoting philosophy professors with elbow patches. You know who they are? They're people you don't see. They're people falling through the cracks every single day and falling behind every single year in American society. They're less economically advanced. They have less education than the average American. And it's going down every year. They're not keeping up with what's going on. They're the ones that are struggling. Let's do politics real quick. Here's something that's even more kind of fascinating about them. Nothing in particular is actually don't even engage in politics that much. Only 5% of them went to a political meeting in the last 12 months. Atheists, 11%. Agnostics, 10%. Only 7% of them attended a protest or march. It was 18% of atheists. By the way, atheists are the most politically active group in America today. Nothing in particular are not. They don't even put up yard signs, for goodness sakes. 14% compared to 27% of atheists. So they're not politically engaged. They're not economically advancing. They have very low levels of education. They are falling behind. Through, they're falling through the cracks of American society, and no one's talking about them. Church attendance, 84% of nothing in particulars attend church never or seldom, compared to 95% of agnostics and 97% of atheists. They go to church a little bit, a little bit, but look at this one. This is the question, how important is religion in your life? Amongst nothing in particular, 11% of them say religion is very important, and 21% say it's somewhat important. You know what it is amongst atheists and agnostics? Less than 5%. So a third of them say that religion is at least somewhat important in their lives. I wrote a piece for the Gospel Coalition saying, stop debating atheists. Where's the fertile field? You can see it right there, can't you? These people are not turned off by religion. A lot of them actually still have a warm feeling toward religion. And here's how I know that for a fact. So I have a survey that ran from 2011 to 2020. They asked the same people the same questions every year from 2011 to 2020. They asked you what your religious affiliation was in 2011. And they found those same people nine years later and asked them the same question. This is how the nuns moved around the religion space, okay? Look at atheists. Atheists who were atheists in 2011, 78% of them were still atheists in 2020, and then 9% became agnostic, and 9% became nothing in particular. 1% of them became Christians. 
1%, and 3% were in another faith group. Amongst agnostics, 53% were agnostic, 22% were nothing in particular, and 16% were atheists. 6% became Christians. Look at the top number. Amongst nothing in particulars, 61% were still nothing in particular, 10% were agnostic, 6% were atheists, but look, 15% of them became Christians a decade later. And remember, this is the largest religious group in America, nothing in particular, right? Most nuns are what? Nothing in particular. And those people are the most likely to go back to Christianity, 15% of them. I'm not a good at math, but if the nuns, if 15% if of the nuns come back to faith, that's 4% of America coming back to religion every decade. That's almost more than all the atheists in this country combined. That's a lot of people, right? That's the group you should be thinking about. The nothing in particular is where all the movement's going. And that leads me to this. This is how American religion works, okay? About two-thirds of us, depending on the survey, are religious. That's Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Mormon, Muslim, whatever. Religious, theistic, religious, okay? In the middle is nothing in particular, okay? In the middle. I think that's the transfer station between religion and non-religion in this country, okay? And then you have your agnostics are 6% and your atheists are 7%. Almost no one in America goes from being religious to being an atheist just like that. They go through that sort of questioning period and you know what they are? They're nothing in particulars in that moment, right? And people who are going to leave religion and go to being atheists are going to probably flow through the nothing in particular transfer station at some point. And people who go from being atheist to being religious again... They're going to go back through that. That is the most important portion of the American population. And it's 23% of us amongst young people. It's 33% of us. It only growing from there. That is where the battle is being fought for souls and lives and futures. And not just spiritually, by the way, but also speaking as a social scientist, the nothing in particular is terrify me. Because they, they feel like they have nothing. No one speaks for them. They're falling behind. They want to be what their parents were, but they live in a world their parents did not live in growing up. They are struggling. So, some takeaways. First, I think that a lot of pastors lay in bed at night and go, why am I so bad at this? Why is my church getting smaller? Why is my giving going down? My attendance going down? Why are there few people getting baptized every year? I think a lot of ways secularizations like globalization, it was inevitable. We were going to become less religious over time. Just the big question for me is why has it took so long, right? Every time every politician stands on a stage like this and says, I will bring jobs back to America. You know what they end up doing? Not bringing jobs back to America. My favorite example is a, there was a Maytag plant in Indiana. It was going to close down, send all the jobs to Mexico. A politician steps in and goes, we're going to keep those jobs. We're going to subsidize those jobs. They gave a bunch of money to Maytag. They still sent the jobs to Mexico. And then they used the money they got from the government to create robots so they could make the, make the washers with robots. You ain't bringing jobs back to America like that, right? It's an inevitability of what's going on with America. We were going to become more secular. And the world that we used to live in is never going to exist again. Let me say that clearly. The world we are going to live in is not a world we've ever seen before, period. We think in social science and cycles. This is not a cycle. This is one direction. Okay? It is not going back to the way it was in the 1950s. There's absolutely nothing I see in the data that tells me that's going to happen. We're going in a whole different direction where sec half of America will be secular in the next 30 or 40 years. We don't know what that looks like. We've never had to deal with that before. So the other thing, though, is as a pastor, I have to say there are 60 million nuns in this country. There are 60 million stories of why people became nuns. I love spreadsheets, and you guys do too. But when I look at a spreadsheet, every single row is an individual, right? Every single row I have to constantly remind myself that every single nun is a person, not a group, right? They all have their own stories. And doing this kind of thing has taught me that they all have their own stories. And some of them are absolutely ridiculous. Like I stopped going to church because they moved the service time up 30 minutes. And I don't like waking up on Sunday morning, right? Or I didn't like the way the pastor cut his hair. But then others are like, well, I was abused by a pastor when I was a child, right? It runs the gamut from very trivial to very, very real. Listen to each one of them individually. You'll learn a lot, right? Pastors, 
Stop posting Facebook political memes, please. I have a lot of pastor friends on social media, and they, what are you doing? You know what Michael Jordan said one time? He was asked, why is he not more political? He goes, because Republicans buy sneakers too. You get my point here? Democrats deserve Jesus. Libertarians deserve Jesus. Independents deserve Jesus. You get what I'm saying here? Everyone deserves Jesus. And if you start posting stuff about how a certain party is bad, you basically turned off a significant portion of your potential membership. Why? Right? Everyone needs Jesus, no matter who you vote for on November. Everyone needs Jesus. I don't feel like that's that controversial, right? <clears throat> I don't feel like that's saying too much. But I'm also will tell pastors this. They go, I'm scared of politics. Me too. I'm terrified of it. You know, you should teach them how to think about the world biblically. There's this concept called a mago day. You guys ever heard of it before? Every human being is born in the image and likeness of God. Every human being, whether legal or illegal, whether born or unborn, God cares about them because they're a person. And when you teach that theology, you know what you're te teaching people? The Democrats are wrong, and so are the Republicans. Teach them a biblical worldview. Right? Not a partisan worldview, but a biblical worldview. And see how that changes things. Because right now, if you don't talk about politics, you know who is? Rachel Maddow and Tucker Carlson. They're discipling your people. I'd rather you pastors do that than them. Right? So, I'll end with a story. You guys know the parable of the sower, right? My church is about 10 or 15 people. About 10 years ago, we decided if we closed down, no one outside our walls would care. So we need to create something that people care if we closed down. We started a brown bag Friday program. We packed little sacks of brown paper sacks with about 13 items, Pop-Tarts and cookies and a drink and some fruit. And we roll that bag up. We put them in boxes and we take them to the school and the social workers are treating them. My, my, my kids go to public school. 80% of kids there on free or reduced lunch, grinding poverty, right? These kids don't have anything to eat over the weekend. So we give them this brown paper sack, our little church. Our entire budget last year was $30,000. We spent an extra $10,000 on brown bag Friday, Okay. We put a little paper in with our brown bags that say, we're First Baptist Church, we don't know you, but we love you. If you need anything, give us a call. One time on a Friday, the bag goes out, we get a call from a grandmother. I'm taking care of my grandson, it's getting cold, I can't afford a coat, can you help? We just so happen to be having a rummage sale in the fellowship hall that very weekend. And we said, come on down, get whatever you want. She comes down 30 minutes later with herself and her grandson, they pick out three big sacks full of clothes, and the smile on that grandmother's face is something I'll never, ever forget. Never got her name, never got her grandson's name, but I don't care. Because you know what matters the most? When that kid's sitting at a bar when he's 25 years old and someone rails about how bad religion is, you know what I hope he says? A church that did not love me, did not know me, loved me. Right? In the face of all this changing going on in America, if you want to change the world, you know where you start? Yourself. Your church can change your community if you want it to. And if you want to measure that by how many conversions you do and how many comment cards you get, good luck. But you know what I care about? That little boy knows that the coat that he was wearing that winter was provided by the folks at First Baptist Church who do not know him yet love him because he was born in the image and likeness of God. There's a lot of bleakness out there but there's always the hope of possibility. The parable of the sower says, keep throwing the seeds, right? It's not your responsibility where they land. Your job is to continue to throw the seeds. Never, ever tire of doing that good work. Thank you so much.